This episode contains content that may cause discomfort or trigger certain individuals. Murder in My Bedroom encourages listener discretion, especially for those who are sensitive to graphic cases involving children. Today, we discuss the horrifying kidnapping and murder of 12-year-old Marion Parker, discovered by her father in the most gruesome way possible. This case is by far the most insane, twisted case I've covered so far, so stick around because this case is one worth listening to. Hey guys, I'm Jordan, and thank you for tuning in to another episode of Murder in My Bedroom. As previously mentioned, I do want to express that this case is very graphic and involves a child. If these topics seem like they might upset you or trigger you, it's okay. You do not have to watch this week's episode. Always remember, you come first. Hopefully, I'll catch you next week. Let's hop right into it. Perry Marion Parker married Geraldine Hazel in 1906. The couple lived at 1631 South Wilton Place, Los Angeles, California. Los Angeles is modernly known as the home of many celebrities and social media influencers. Los Angeles has a current population of 3,769,485. On January 14, 1907, Perry Marion Parker and Geraldine Hazel had a son named Perry Willard Parker. On October 11, 1915, eight years after baby Parker was born, Mary and Francis and Majorie Helen Parker, the identical twin daughters of Perry and Geraldine, were born. On December 15, 1927, the day of the abduction, a well-dressed man wearing a heavy grayish brown overcoat, black shoes, and a dark hat named Mr. Cooper entered Mount Vernon Junior High School and requested to see the Parker girl right away. He convinced the school registrar, Miss Mary Holt, to allow Marion to leave with him by falsely claiming that her father was his boss and that he was in a terrible car accident. When Mr. Cooper asked for the Parker girl, Miss Holt then asked which one. This seemed to have shocked Mr. Cooper, and then he replied, Marion. The school secretary, Naomi Flinton, brought Marion to the office, where she was excused to leave with Mr. Cooper. Mr. Cooper said to Marion, Don't cry, little girl. I'll take you to your daddy, as she climbed into the passenger side of a coupe. This will be the last time 12-year-old Marion would be seen alive. Concern arises at the Parker home when one daughter, Majorie, returns without her twin, Marion. Geraldine then telephoned the twin's friends and parents. No one had seen Marion or could provide any possible whereabouts. Marion's father, who was definitely not in a car accident, heart sank when he received a note that read, Do positively nothing till you receive a special delivery letter signed Marion Parker. I would like to note Marion's name is spelled wrong in this note, with an A instead of an O before the N. A short time had passed and the family received a second letter. Marion secure. Use good judgment. Interference with my plans. Dangerous. Signed, Marion Parker with an A and George Fox. These letters are visually creepy to say the least. With random pen strokes and marks, the word interference was underlined in the note. Perry contacted school officials who were shocked to hear Mr. Parker on the other end and they promptly explained what happened with this Mr. Cooper. Perry immediately called the authorities. Police documented Marion's description, 4'6", around 100 pounds, dressed in an English print dress, brown Oxford shoes, and tan stockings. She had straight, dark brown hair bobbed to her jawline. She looked exactly like Majorie. Police were able to obtain a description of the man that claimed to be Mr. Cooper, white, between 25 and 30, about 5'8", 150 pounds. He was wearing a heavy grayish brown overcoat, black shoes, and a dark hat. These descriptions went straight to the press. Every single officer took these descriptions and searched for hours and hours for Marion's whereabouts, and there were no leads anywhere. The following day, a ransom note demanding $15,000 in gold certificates for her safe return is received by the Parker family. Out of all the notes received, page 3 in this note is by far the most disturbing one. Handwritten in many different fonts, it is clear that this letter took a while to write. For my audio listeners, check out the sources link below to view the full ransom notes. For the sake of time, I will be reading parts of the note. My video watchers, feel free to pause. Leave out police and detectives. Make no public notice. Keep this affair private. Make no search. Failure to comply with these requests means no one will ever see the girl again, except the angels in heaven. If you want aid against me, ask God, not man. He gave the family 72 hours to come up with the money. I would like to know, on top of $15,000 of gold certificates being an overwhelmingly large amount of money, this was in the 1920s and the economy was very different. This amount is a lot more than it sounds. The note was part of a set with two other notes attached. All three notes were signed Fate, Death, and The Fox. 
One of the letters included a postscript written in Marion's handwriting. Daddy, please do what this man tells you, or he'll kill me if you don't. Your loving daughter, Marion Parker. The Fox sent instructions to deliver the money to 10th Street in Grimacy Place on December 17, 1927. Perry Parker followed the instructions given by the kidnapper and attempted to deliver the ransom money at the specified location. Unknowingly to Perry, the police were actively following him and actually followed him to this location. The Fox fled when he realized the police were following him. The Fox sent more letters claiming that Marion was still alive. He claimed that Marion saw him during the handoff and she wondered why her dad didn't help her. The Fox asked asked Perry to wait for a telephone call and then cautioned him to keep law enforcement away. On December 17, 1927, at 7.35 p.m., Perry received a telephone call from the Fox instructing him to bring the money to another location, West 5th Street and South Manhattan Place in Los Angeles. Perry complied and promptly followed the Fox's instructions and was at the second location with the money by 8 p.m. A Chrysler Coupe pulled up slowly next to Perry's car the fox was in the front seat with his face concealed by a bandana. He waved a firearm and asked if Perry had saw it. Perry replied he did and then asked if Marion was okay. Perry saw her slumped in the passenger seat. She's sleeping, said the fox, reassuring the distressed Perry. Perry relieved then handed over the money. Almost simultaneously, the car drove up the street and pushed Marion onto the curb. The Chrysler Coupe drove away and Perry instantly ran to Marion who appeared to be sleeping. He didn't even put his car in park. He cradled 12-year-old Marion, and that's when he noticed her face was pale. Perry discovered his daughter's lifeless body on the curb. All of her limbs were severed, and she was disemboweled. Any relief he felt while holding his daughter was immediately crushed. The initial autopsy was actually conducted by Marion's neighbor, Dr. A. E. Wagner. He must have been so devastated to find out it was little Marion. It is believed that this conflict of interest interfered with his judgment as he listed the cause of death as exhaustion and fright. I knew Marion Parker, explained Dr. Wagner. She was a nervous child. When she realized her situation, she probably neither slept nor partook of food during those three terrible days. She died only 12 hours earlier. Marion was most likely alive during the first attempted meeting. There was no sign of sexual assault, no sign of drugs like chloroform. The fox stuffed Marion's body with rags and sewed her eyes open. On December 18, 1927, bundles wrapped in newspaper tied with a length of twine containing Marion's limbs and organs were found by civilians in Elysian Park. The families around the area were in great fear for their children. The same day, a blood-soaked suitcase with a spool of thread matching the thread used to sew Marion's eyes open was discovered on a front lawn by a woman at 620 Manhattan Street. Around this time, the horrifying details detailing Marion's manner of death were leaked to the press. A nationwide wide manhunt was conducted involving over 20,000 police officers and volunteers. The Parker family and concerned citizens raised a 100,000 reward for the identification and the capture of the fox. A harsh investigation leads police to suspect William Edward Hickman, a former employee of Perry Parker as the perpetrator. William was born in Sebastian, Arkansas in 1908. He was the youngest of Eva and William H. William grew up in Kansas City, Missouri, but the family was deserted by their father in 1925. William was considered a good student during his time at Central High School. He was active in many clubs, including the debate team. William was the messenger boy at First National Bank. He was convicted for forging stolen checks in June of 1927 and served time for the crimes. Perry Parker, Marion's father's testimony, played a role in his conviction. Evidence gathered includes an address found one of the kidnapper's notes, 2518 Birch Street. Towels found stuffed inside Marion's abdomen were branded with the name of an apartment building where William lived. Bellevue Arms, located at 168 Bellevue Avenue in Los Angeles. Detectives also found fingerprints linking those from William's previous arrest. On December 20th, police went to an apartment to investigate and encountered a man who fit the description of Marion's abductor. The man who lived in apartment 315 identified himself as Donald Evans and allowed the police to search his apartment. Police found no evidence, but then Donald Evans just disappeared. Investigators later learned that William Edward Hickman was the one who rented apartment 315. It was obvious that this Donald Evans, also known as Mr. Cooper, and the Fox was clearly William, and he was clearly responsible for all of this horror. 
police located the car used to get the ransom, the owners reported it stolen just weeks prior. Prints from the notes matched those found on the vehicle as well as the fingerprints on file from William Hickman's previous arrest. A gas station attendant in Oregon thought he recognized William driving a green Hudson sedan. Soon after in Seattle, a $20 ransom note was used to purchase clothing. The police up north were on very high alert. On December 22nd, 1927, William Hickman was arrested in Echo, Oregon after he was spotted driving a stolen green Hudson sedan by two police officers on their smoke break. He shrugged his shoulders and said, well, I guess it's all over. William confessed to the kidnapping and murder of Marion Parker, claiming that he wanted money for college tuition and killed her when she recognized him. According to William, the two met before when she accompanied her father to work. William claimed he strangled her and dismembered her body to make it easier to conceal. He then realized Perry wouldn't pay for a child who was dead, so he filled her with towels and sewed her eyes open to make it look like she was alive. He wrote a 19-page confession during his transportation to California. The trial began on January 25, 1928, and Hickman pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. He said a supernatural being called Providence urged him to kill, but he also wrote to another inmate and asked how to act crazy. However, his erratic behavior and additional confession of murdering a pharmacist, Clarence Toms, during a holdup complicated his defense. The trial concluded on February 9th, 1928, with Hickman being found guilty of first degree murder after the jury deliberated for only 36 minutes. He was sentenced to death. William told the press, to die is cast, and the state wins by a neck. I don't think I have much to live for, and I don't know yet why I killed that Parker girl, but I did, and I'll take my punishment. Before guards marched William, he asked guards to hear his final confession. After three days of captivity, Marion began to get restless. William tied her to a chair in his apartment, and on December 17th, he went to mail a ransom letter. When he returned, Marion insisted he free her. She was starting to get loud, and William feared she might attract attention. William approached Marion from behind. He placed a towel around her neck and strangled her. He recalled how Marion squirmed and flailed for two minutes, give or take. Then she went quiet and limp. On October 19th, 1928, Hickman was executed by hanging at San Quentin for the murder of Marion Parker. It is reported that William fainted when the executioner placed the black hood over his head. Geraldine and Perry Parker mourned the loss of their daughter and they advocated forgiveness for the school employees involved in their abduction. I just realized I've been saying Marjorie's name wrong. I'm so sorry. I don't know why I put it in the script wrong. So just know out of this entire episode, I just realized that I'm really bad with pronouncing names. <laughs> Marjorie Parker and Perry Willard Parker lived out their lives with Marjorie marrying and settling in San Diego. Perry Willard served in the U.S. Air Force in the Korean War and passed at age 75. Thanks for tuning into this week's episode of Murder in My Bedroom. Today's sources are heathermonroe.com and worldpopulationreview.com, all sources linked below. Make sure you subscribe if you enjoyed this episode and follow Murder in My Bedroom on all social media. Contact Murder in My Bedroom Podcast at gmo.com for any inquiries or case requests. That concludes today's episode, and I'll see you guys later. As always, special thanks to Fesley and Studios for the royalty free soundtracks, and also special thanks to Heather Monroe for the very detailed and well written article linked below. You can listen to Murder in My Bedroom in the car, on the treadmill, or even in the shower. Be sure to check out Murder in My Bedroom on Spotify Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, and any other podcast platforms you may listen on. Please subject all case requests to Murder in My Bedroom Podcast at gmo.com. Thanks for listening.